Hi, I'm Tom Fitton. I'm president of Judicial Watch. I'm happy to give you this uh, live update about Judicial Watch's uh, busy week this week. Uh, some major developments. Uh, of course, many of you know we've been conducting discovery on the Clinton email scandal. What discovery means we're taking testimony, and our lawyers took the testimony of two people this week. Yuma Abedin, who was Mrs. Clinton's chief of staff or deputy chief of staff at the State Department, and Patrick Kennedy, who's a senior bureaucrat at the State Department, top records official there. He's been there before about forever. Now, Abedin's testimony was pretty interesting because she testified that it was Mrs. Clinton's decision to use her email system uh, to conduct all of her government business. Uh, she didn't really think about FOIA. She never was asked to do a FOIA request search. Uh, she said that at one point uh, they missed a call with the French foreign minister uh, because of Clinton's email system, and uh, both she and her were frustrated that the email system that was supposedly very convenient got in the way of Mrs. Clinton's ability to do her job. So as you might imagine, that garnered a lot of headlines this week, Aberdeen's testimony. So go on Facebook. Uh, we've got a bunch of stories that we've linked. And go to our website at judicialwatch.org uh, to find out more about that deposition. And, you know, I tell you, just go to the website and also review the transcript. So if you don't trust my analysis, Go and look at the transcript and you can figure out what's up and what's down with Yuma Abedin's testimony. Uh, Patrick Kennedy's testimony was something else. He was a senior bureaucrat, the top records official at the, administra at the State Department for Mrs. Clinton. Uh, he still is. He didn't think anything of uh, uh, Mrs. Clinton's email use. It was the first time he ever received emails from the uh, Secretary of State for all of his 40 plus years there at the State Department, yet didn't think anything of it. Didn't think anything of whether or not the Freedom of Information Act was impacted by the Clinton email issue. Uh, and so he, despite being the responsible official, seemingly washed his hands. And like the other bureaucrats that have testified from the State Department, you know, there's been this willful blindness. They thought nothing of it. They never asked any questions. There's no curiosity. And with bureaucrats like that, it was no surprise that Mrs. Clinton was able to do what she was able to do, which was to avoid uh, the Freedom of Information Act and keep all those emails away from the American public until we forced the State Department and Mrs. Clinton and, frankly, her aides to release the emails that they had been uh, keeping from the American people. These were emails they were uh, on which they were conducting government business and they weren't using State Department accounts. They were using personal accounts. Mrs. Clinton had ClintonEmail.com. Aberdeen had an email account on that account, too. And uh, other officials like Cheryl Mills and other top officials uh, also used uh, their other personal accounts to conduct a lot of State Department business, which put a lot of things at risk, we believe. And so we're still getting new documents uh, from the Clinton email system, believe it or not. Now, I wrote, Ms. Clinton says she turned over everything. Well, in fact, we have found she didn't have turned over all the emails because, as the Washington Post pointed out, there are 160 emails at least that they found that they didn't turn over. And that number includes the number we gave them this week, which was we found 127 emails that Mrs. Clinton sent or received that she did not turn over to the State Department. Now, she told the court in our case, under oath, under penalty of perjury, as far as she knew, all the emails were turned over. Her campaign has said all the emails were turned over. So they would have had you believe that everything they had was turned over, but yet they've missed at least these 120 key emails. Uh, and they are key because they don't make Mrs. Clinton look good. Uh, they uh, show that uh, she was warned about, for instance, the security problems of her BlackBerry use and other things like that. So there was good reason for her to withhold them if indeed she did that. So uh, another scandal uh, for, for uh, another element of the scandal on the Clinton email matter and speaking of the scandalous Clinton email matter, we had a scandalous meeting between Bill Clinton and Loretta Lynch uh, just, I guess, yesterday, the day before yesterday. Bill Clinton shows up and Loretta Lynch is playing out in Phoenix, and uh, it was a secret meeting no one knew about. The uh, reporter uh, out in Phoenix, I think, uh, exposed it, and it's caused quite a, a storm here in Washington, D.C., and... Uh, because why the heck is Loretta Lynch meeting with Bill Clinton, the spouse of someone under a criminal investigation, uh, who's arguably a witness in the case, and frankly, given the Clinton connections, both Bill and Hillary's involvement in the cash machine at the State Department, he could very well be the subject of the investigation, too. Why would the Attorney General meet with him? Why? And uh, we thought it important to ask the Inspector General of the Justice Department to 
conduct an investigation, and we sent that complaint in yesterday. I'm looking at the release here yesterday that we put out on it. And, uh, you know, government officials like Loretta Lynch and lawyers like Loretta Lynch are supposed to avoid even the appearance of a conflict in these circumstances like this. And she made it clear that uh, she is um, uh, didn't talk about anything of substance with him, uh, but I don't necessarily believe that. The meeting itself has raised questions, and uh, we want an independent uh, investigation of what went on. Now, today, supposedly, she's going to say that she's going to agree to whatever the FBI recommends and the Justice Department lawyers recommend. You know, I just don't believe it. And uh, uh, obviously, there are grave concerns about how justice is going to be administered by Loretta Lynch's Justice Department in the Clinton email matter. And this scandal isn't going away, and it's just going to get worse and worse and worse. Uh, so uh, this is an important development, and uh, so we'll be watching that carefully. We already have also Freedom of Information Act requests out uh, investigating that meeting, so we're going to be in the middle of it, as we've been so much so in the Clinton email issue. Uh, we had an extraordinary story this week also in our Corruption Chronicles blog uh, documenting that there may have been a Fast and Furious connection or an indication of a Fast and Furious connection to the Paris terrorist attacks. Uh, you remember those terrible attacks um, uh, where uh, the, the Islamists uh, shot up uh, uh, central Paris. Uh, turns out there was a gun that came from Phoenix involved in that attack. And the ATF wanted to keep that under the wraps, but as government source told us about it, and as a result, uh, we exposed it. And, you know, why would the ATF be interested in keeping that info under wraps? Well, it was a gun sold in Phoenix, and... Um, I think it's because of the Fast and Furious connection, but we'll see. So we're still investigating that. And there was some good news this week on election integrity. Believe it or not, well, you probably will believe it, that the left isn't terribly interested in making sure that only citizens vote in our elections. And there was a court case here in Washington, D.C. over that, because believe it or not, a federal agency, the Election Assistance Commission, agreed that three states could uh, require proof of citizenship before registration uh, for voting. And uh, uh, the left was apoplectic at that. Even the Justice Department didn't want to defend it, which is completely out of the ordinary. But a federal judge said it was perfectly legitimate and uh, allowed the decision to go forward. So at least there are three new states that will require proof of citizenship, which is absolutely necessary given the large number of aliens we have here in the United States, both legal and otherwise. And when you've got millions of people here who are not citizens and not eligible to vote, you really have to have structures in place to make sure they aren't voting illegally. Uh, many of them may, may uh, want to do it in a, in a purposeful, malicious way. Others may just vote accidentally. So we just have to stop it from happening and make sure that only eligible, eligible people vote. So voter ID is only one element of our election integrity effort. Uh, there's got to be this effort to ensure that only citizens vote in our elections. And uh, the fact that Justice Department and the left are so adamant against any notion that you uh, require proof of citizenship to vote, you have to wonder why. And I view it, my view is that they want to be able to steal elections with illegal votes. Uh, there's no doubt about it. Uh, so that's a major development, again, uh, on the election integrity front. And it's something the major media won't tell you about, but you can find out about here, uh, because uh, we think, you know, all these debates about public policy may be all for naught, if the left is able to steal elections and you can vote doesn't count. Um, also, we had some uh, Supreme Court uh, terrible decisions, frankly, this week on uh, affirmative action or uh, in Texas where they allowed racial discrimination in education, uh, I guess because it benefits certain uh, uh, minority classes, but uh, it's despite federal law and the Constitution prohibiting it, the Supreme Court thought it was good because it uh, might help diversity, which is just craziness. And then you had this crazy decision uh, and radical decision overturning um, sensible abortion regulations in Texas. Uh, and um, again, uh, if you read the dissents on that Supreme Court decision on abortion, you'll see that the Supreme Court was outside the law in that decision. So it shows you that the, the courts sometimes don't act appropriately and uh, the Supreme Court especially, and it can be politicized the way other institutions can be corrupted here in Washington, D.C. 
So Judicial Watch is keeping an eye on all of this. Uh, we've got a lot going on. The Clinton email issue is really hot. We're going to, uh, we have other discovery that we expect to be approved uh, by another federal court judge. We have more emails coming out on the Clinton email front. And of course, there's this criminal investigation that uh, is, is also out there uh, into the Clinton email issue. So uh, we can't control that since we don't run the Justice Department. But certainly we have an influence because, frankly, our cases uh, have, have provoked uh, the FBI into actually doing something because uh, Judicial Watch was getting discovery and talking to witnesses. And every time we got a ruling saying that we could talk to witnesses from the courts, uh, the FBI and the Justice Department let it be known that they wanted to talk to the witnesses too. Uh, so like many other cases, Judicial Watch is leading the way. Oh, and before I forget, we had the Benghazi report uh, come out from the Select Committee this week. Uh, it was interesting in the sense that it exposed and provided detail on many of the key issues that Judicial Watch has already highlighted over the last two years. It was the Judicial Watch FOIAs that resulted in the, produ into the, in the creation of the Select Committee on Benghazi. And all the headlines you see in the report uh, uh, largely uh, we had highlighted already and exposed over the last two years. So, of course, Congress is a little late to the game to provide important added detail uh, that is devastating. And uh, Benghazi isn't over. Uh, that discovery uh, that I talked about with the Clinton email issue, that's in the Benghazi Freedom of Information Act case. So uh, the Benghazi scandal isn't finished yet, and even the Select Committee is still taking testimony. So uh, we're, we're doing your work uh, that you want done here in Washington, D.C. We appreciate all your support. And I hope, wish you and your family a uh, safe uh, July 4th holiday as we celebrate Independence Day. And I'd like to think we're doing the Founding Fathers uh, justice by doing this important non-governmental work, by being vigilant and making sure this government is accountable to the American people. So uh, happy Independence Day and God bless America. Thank you very much.